Miniso 26 of Futures Radio Show, sponsored by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. Com. Every day, traders and investors dive in to tackle the ever-changing markets to find opportunity. Futures Radio Show is your number one source for answers to the questions that all market participants want to ask. Veteran futures trader Anthony Crudelli sits down with the most influential leaders and top traders in the industry. Now, here's your host, Anthony Crudelli. Hey, everyone. Before we get started today, I want to thank our sponsors. CME Group, Trading Technologies, RJO Futures, and Top Step Trader. Now today I had the chance to speak with two guests, Tracy Shuchart, Independent Trader, and Ira Harris, Independent Trader and Notes from the Underground Blog. Today I had a fun conversation with two fan favorites of Futures Radio Show. At our live event back in October with Ira Harris and Rick Santelli, Tracy was in attendance. And during the show, there was some conversation between Ira and Tracy about oil. Since then, we've had many requests to get them on the show at the same time. Today, we had that opportunity to get both of them on the show, and we started off today's conversation by talking about the correlation between the euro US dollar and WTI crude oil. From there, I asked both of them what they thought about the price of crude oil and what technical and fundamental analysis they are both currently seeing in WTI crude oil. Ira and I chatted about reasons that we are seeing a weak U.S. dollar, strength in gold, and weakness in the bond and treasury markets. I asked Tracy what she thought of the Brent and WTI spread. Finally, I went to Twitter where I asked Tracy and Ira questions from listeners' tweets. As usual, thank you all for listening and please enjoy this episode. Tracy, Ira, welcome back to the show. Oh, thank you. Hey, thanks. Well, it's great to have the two of you here. Now, when we were at the live event back in Chicago in October, we had a moment where Tracy was interacting with Ira uh, in the audience uh, about some of the questions we were talking about in crude oil. And since then, we've had a lot of people write in and say, how about we have Ira and Tracy on the show together? So we're making that happen for everybody. And we're going to jump right into topics today, and we're going to begin with Tracy. Tracy, you wrote a post the other day about explaining uh, the correlation between the euro, U.S. dollar, and WTI crude oil. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? All right. So I mean, people had asked me about it because they were noticing that it basically they were ticking together. So this is not a new correlation. You know, obviously nothing correlated 100% all of the time. However, you know, since since the euro came about, uh, basically this correlation has been, and I, I posted some charts and I'll repost the charts, but the exchange rate, the dollar euro exchange rate has followed crude oil. It's one of the best correlations out there that there is as far as correlations can go. And part of this reason is, is that um, oil exporting countries, um, especially in Europe, um, they trade their assets in dollars, right? Oil sold in USD, um, mostly. But what happens is that as the price of oil increases, you have an increase in their foreign exchange reserves. So part of their foreign exchange reserves, they take those dollars and they buy euros because they're selling primarily to uh, the eurozone. So when the price of oil goes up and foreign, their foreign exchange reserves increase, uh, then more of their purchases can go towards purchasing the euro. Conversely, when the price of oil goes down, foreign exchange reserves decrease, and uh, they buy, you know, less, less dollars are transferred into the euro. So before we get to Ira, what do you do with these correlations, and how do they help you with your trading? Well, I trade oil and the euro a lot. Um, so knowing these correlations... I kind of, I can watch positioning, and if you'll notice, if you look at, like, COT data, you have, as oil uh, longs increase, we had kind of the same 
thing happening in Euro at the same time. So I watched that that data because they do kind of move in tandem. And so that's kind of the, the approach that I would, I would use towards trading both oil and currency. If I saw something flip in uh, one, say massively flip short or, or something like that, we saw you know a huge change in the data and I would probably look for the other to follow. Ira, what do you think about the correlation between the Euro US dollar and WTI crude? Well, Tracy covers it, and it, you know, after six months, you may see these correlations work, and that's and then, of course, you know, they'll break down when there's other things that are important to play, interest rate differentials, which makes currencies, for me, so interesting, but for a lot of people, you know, it's just too much to, to watch. But, but that's right, there are, there are correlations. So when the economies are booming, uh, you get movement out of the dollar and into other currencies, uh, for other reasons, commodity-based currencies, or you know, look at the export um, engine of Europe, uh, Germany. is Germany runs the per capita the largest current account surplus in the world, even bigger than China on a per capita basis. So you have all these developments. So, and the rise in oil prices certainly reflect that the global economy has been stronger than most uh, pundits had anticipated, whether there was other factors involved. We'll find out, um, but it's, it's, the correlation is, is holding now. Uh, and that's historically, the, the dollar oil correlation really has played well, but it does play well with other commodities too, because as long as the world's commodities are priced in dollars, you are gonna find uh, short-term correlations in those movements. Um, how long they hold? Uh, you, you better do your homework because you could get caught, you know, blindsided. But while the momentum's there in any of those trades, it, it's worth playing. And it's really, tra otherwise, Tracy covered it very well. Speaking of momentum, crude continues to stay strong. Now, it has come off its highs of 66.66. And as we record today, I think we're just sitting just above 64 bucks. Now, I know that both of you are day traders. And you'll talk about macro, but it's not necessarily the way that you're going to trade it. Now, since I know that both of you do look at fundamentals and you do look at technicals, let's go with Ira first. What are some of the fundamentals and technicals saying to you right now about what's happening in crude oil? Well, I, I'll go back to uh, what you introduced when Tracy and I uh, had a uh, back and forth when uh, at the October 5th, I think it was with Santelli and you. Um, and the fundamentals were heavily with the supply side and that demand was a little soft. So we've shifted since then. But I had pointed out was something that concerned me was the fact that, that, on, that on October 4th, the Saudi king went to Russia. And we didn't see it play out enough then. But if you look at that week following, that's when the crew put in its recent low. And then we've moved up you know, fairly significantly out of there. So something took place in Saudi Arabia. Don't, I mean, in Russia, in between the Saudi uh, king and what he wanted from Putin. And oil prices have more than stabilized. They've gone, they've gone higher. I, I don't know what's taken place, but there's a lot of instability in the Mideast. And it's not the instability per se, but it's the role of Russia within this uh, instability. Now, recently, as of yesterday, people were talking about, well, uh, that's because Saudis have pulled back on supply because they want oil prices higher in order to bring a Ramco to market. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice story. It kind of fits. I'm one who believes that a Ramco will never become a publicly held company. That could be wrong. Uh, amen. Be, right? <laughs> yes, 100% agree. 100% agree. 100%. Because I don't know where they'd be listed. Because if they list in the United States, I'm a shareholder. I'm a large shareholder. I'm a Carl Icahn. Now all of a sudden we're going to start pressing the Saudi government to cut to cut uh, to cut production in order to list the right. Because because once you list in the United States, if I'm a shareholder, you have to do, you know, you have to act in the shareholder interest. Well, exactly. The the interest of the Saudi government. Is far different than any shareholder interest. So I, I think there's a lot of noise about this. Unless, unless they're going to list in uh, Beijing, in uh, Shanghai, I don't, I don't, I just don't see it happen. Western societies are far too litigious 
for the Saudis to uh, bring this about. I absolutely agree about this IPO. There's just too many reasons that they don't even need to list. You know, they're very private about their, you know, their reserves. It's a very close society. You know, having all of these analysts and auditors, I, I just can't see them really wanting that, that to happen. It may sound like a good idea, but in reality, I, I don't see it happening. So let's go with Tracy a little bit here. Tracy, I know you are always posting uh, a lot of technicals and a lot of fundamental reasons why crude may do something. Looking at crude right now, do you see fundamentals backing this rally? Do you see fundamentals not supporting this rally? And talk to us a little bit uh, of some of the things you're seeing on the bigger picture technical side. Okay. Well, um, I mean, overall, you know, I think we saw supplies tightening, deserved a rally. Um, but kind of what uh, more of what I'm looking at right now, <laughs> it, you know, as far as with oils moved up, that's here in London. What I'm looking at now fundamentally is I'm looking at the COT data. We have an overloaded long boat. Um, we have some decreasing demand in China. We have U.S. production that is you know, increasing. Uh, we just surpassed uh, Saudi Arabia due to surpass Russia. Um, and then we have the upcoming maintenance season. So as far as fundamental, fundamentals that are, are concerned right now in the here and now, that's kind of what I'm looking at. So I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see oil back off a little bit um, as, as we are. Now, when you say COT data and you say that it's way overloaded, give us an idea of that measurement that, that's telling you it's overloaded. So, well, we're 12 to 1 long to short. <laughs> so that's, you know that's higher than we've ever been. Um, so that's long to short, right? So when you have an imbalance, that much of an imbalance, what happens is when these funds start to um, liquidate their positions or take profits, what happens is when it's too one-sided, whether it's too long or too short, uh, when people start to take profits, then you know that can sort of snowball. So, to speak. so, you know, I, I look at positioning within that, that respect and, you know, and I look for uh, majorly uh, overbought or, over, or oversold. And then I start looking for, you know, turns, changes to that data. Gotcha. Now, I threw up a, a chart of the daily crude oil and just to see where it is in moving averages. And I talk about this a lot. I use basic moving averages just to give me guidance as to where trend is. I don't trade using them, but I like to see where they are. And I noticed that the 50-day moving average in crude, the last time it even traded it was back in October. And the more I look at this crude daily chart, it reminds me a lot of S&P. It just keeps sitting above the 10 and 20-day moving averages and continuing to uh, grind higher. Is there any simple form of technical analysis that you may look at and can share with everyone that if it starts to breach it, then we may see some weakness added to CL. And if it, if it holds above it, we might continue to see uh, us go a little bit higher in crude. We'll start with Tracy, and then I'll see what Ira thinks. Um, and yeah, I mean, I use, um, I use the 5, 8, and 13 day a lot, um, as far as, especially because we've been holding the 5 day the whole time. So, and I've done several posts on this. Um, and, you know, until, since 57, we've been holding the 5 day. It's just been bouncing off of it. So, you know, for me... In simple technical terms, you know, I wanted to see that five-day breach and then become uh, resistant, and then to see if we could start moving down and start breaking some of those supports, those MAs. Ira, were, is there anything you're looking at right now? Well, you know, I things I write about with the blog is, you know, I look at the 200-day. Even though I'm, you, you call me a day trader, there's times I'm holding positions for a week or two weeks if I see uh, what I want. So I look at the 200-day moving average. I look at the 200-week moving average for, for bigger things. You know, I, I know people who do Fibonacci. You know, it, I'm not that good a technician because I can't do it all. So, you know, there's certain people who's work. Um, Dave, who's done really good work from Keystone, people send me some things to look at because they know the, the way my mind kind of works and they really are, look to help me. And I have to sift through a lot of stuff. But uh, his work, Keystone Charts, is, is pretty good. And uh, Mike Oliver from um, MSA, because they're not only technicians, but they understand the fundamentals. 
And that's a big thing for me because a lot of technicians, you know, they toss the fundamentals. They don't care about it. Well, my, you know, my analysis starts with the fundamentals. And then when I, when I make a trade, I'm trying to find my lowest risk point. This is the hardest part in today's world because we're all trying to adapt to the, how the algos drive the markets when there's no substance to the headlines and yet you get, you know, great volatility. So I try to use those moments like tomorrow afternoon when the, uh, when the Fed announcement comes, I'll have orders set at what I consider to be very good value plays and hope that I'll get enough volatility off the headlines because there's no analysis to the headlines. They're just, they're looking for keywords. That's all they are is keyworded. And if they drive the market to levels where I can find a low risk trade, that's what I'm looking for. So I'm doing a lot more of that. It takes a lot of patience. And being, you know, an old Ford trader, even though I've been off the floor for over 20 years, you know, you still have some of those habits where you've got to jump in. Well, I do less jumping now when I'm, when I'm trading well, I'm doing less jumping and I'm waiting for my levels. I mean, you make a great point, Ira, and I think that a lot of traders like myself have had to make a shift. When we used to have unemployment or Fed days, I used to look to trade right as the data came out, and I used to try to trade based upon what the headline was. That has been taken away from point-and-click traders. I've known that for years. And the point you just made was that you use that volatility to help you get in in prices you may not be able to get an opportunity to get in on, let's just call a regular day. I don't want to speak for you, Ira, but is that what you're getting at? Yeah, absolutely. I call them, you know, when I work with you know, the guys who I, who I do some consulting with, I call them wish orders. Put them in. You won't believe what you'll find. So, you know, if I have a view towards silver and I'm bullish towards silver, I won't have a position because I've, I've learned don't have a position because they're going to drive to levels. And if I miss a trade, I miss a trade. Nothing I can do about it because um, they'll give me another opportunity. But like, Tomorrow, I, if the Fed were to probably view it, depending upon what we hear tonight from Trump, as a, maybe a 20% probability that the Fed may move tomorrow. And that's really high because two days ago, I was at 5% probability that they could possibly hike rates. But if they were to hike rates, where would I like to buy silver? And I'll put it in order. And it may be 80 cents below the market, but that's where I'm going to be. I will have my work done. But, hey, you're going to give me that opportunity if it's that quick? Okay, let's go. If I get run over, I'm, I'll know what to do with it. Uh, but that, that's what I call wish order. And I use them more and more to, to, uh, to get an opportunity for my lowest risk profile trade that I can find. Tracy, do you do something similar in crude oil? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I have, you know, I prefer to, even though, you know, I day trade it, I like IRA where I have a swing account and a, and, a, and a day account, but I mean, I still look for edges in the market. And if I get filled, I get filled. That's great. If I don't, I, I don't get filled. That's fine. There's, there's another trade to be had, but, um, you know, definitely that's my approach as well. So you can't chase the market. So you, you have your levels. You put the order in and you let the market come to you. If it doesn't come to you, then you move on to the next one. I can add one thing, you know, because what Tracy talks about and what traders like us have to adjust to, you're not going to outspeed these people. They, they spend millions upon millions upon millions of dollars for thinking in nanoseconds. I can't even think in nanoseconds. I don't even know what that means. So I have to be um, prepared for when the market reacts in a very crazy fashion based on just algo headline driven algorithms and, and wait for and, and seize that opportunity. I have to be prepared for it because it's going to come that quick. They don't know why it's going there either. It's, it's just purely, you know, reaction function of the way the algos work and you have to be prepared for it. You cannot race these people. You, it's, you are, it's, it's sure death. <laughs> no, it, it definitely is. Now, I want to stay with you, Ira, for a little bit. I want to talk about something that I trade a, a lot more uh, these days than I did in the past, and that's the bond and treasury market. Now, it's been consistently trading week for the past few months, and I've been noticing on my strategy that these short alerts I've been getting, they've been working really, really well. But I like to have confirmations, Ira. I, you and I talk about this all the time. I love to see what's happening in the dollar, what's happening in the gold markets. And seeing a weak bond and treasury market with a strong gold market, 
I'm getting buy signals in gold and sell signals in treasuries, which I don't like. And I'm looking at the dollar just, just getting destroyed to the downside. I'm looking at this going, this is odd. And it's one of those things where I never really ask why something is happening, but I'm confused at what's going on here. So I, I want to know, what do you think about this trade that we're seeing right now with weak dollar, weak bond in treasuries, and strong gold? This is the big question out there. Forget about the bonds. Bond and gold have a correlation. I'm using the 30 years because I've, I've kept that chart for 35 years only because they have an inverse correlation to the other based on total psychology of the marketplace. Because there's no, there's no rationale to a 30-year bond. I don't care what any economic text tells me. 30 years, I can't tell you what's going to be in 30 days with any real certainty. So... 30 years. And it's just like gold. Gold is a barometer of people's psychological feelings. Yes, it's a store of value, but you only go to it as a store of value in times when you feel somewhat uncertain. And that uncertainty can can come from many places. But I, as I, as I've said to people, I said, you know, I've been neutral to bullish gold, Anthony, as you know, I will turn bearish when the short interest rate you know, we can use not the two-year, but the the Fed funds rate, the 90-day T-bill rate, when that goes to a premium over inflation. So that if I buy a T-bill at 2.5% and inflation's 2%, I'm getting a 50% real yield, that will be a, a headwind for, for gold, as it will for other things. But that's what I'm looking for. So the long end of the market really does not move the gold market. You know, you get these People on TV who are, you know, they got to tell some story and they say, well, you know, the 10 year yields are higher. That's not what affects it. First of all, it very rarely does it affect the stock market per se. It's really, you're seeing the flattening of that curve, which is more dramatic because it's showing the tight, the short end of the curve is tightening and the Fed is actually getting a little tight. They're not tight enough yet because let's say the Fed funds rate is 1.5. The inflation rate is 1.7, 1.8. Some people will argue, of course, higher. You have a negative real yield. Negative real yields push all asset prices higher. That's, that's just a fact throughout time. Because as long as the cash that I'm holding or the short-dated deposits that I'm holding are really yielding a negative return, well, I'm going to search for other things besides cash. Cash really historically needs to return one percent real yield so we should really be at three percent right now and we're not near close and i think that's part of the dollar story by the way too that people are a little bit nervous that with all this new debt coming on and everything around it and real yields still being negative there's not a whole lot of reason to park your money in dollar yeah you may buy some dollar assets but not to sit in cash dollars it's just just doesn't make sense so don't be confused about it the, the gold is you know what People are going, well, why is the gold here? Because we know, because if we go back three or four years, we were on that risk on, risk off parity, you know, the paradigm. That's been broken because gold, the equities have rallied together. You know, how can that happen? There are positions out there that are enormous, and that's where we'll get to by the end of this show. But don't be, don't be perplexed by it. It's, it's actually holding in there pretty well, and now it's going to be a guess as to what the new Fed chairman, which route he's going to take her. Hey, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the show so far, but I want to pause and thank one of our sponsors, Trading Technologies. I started using TT in the year 2000, and I love it. It is by far the best trading platform I have ever used, and I've tried a lot of them. With TT, you can trade the global markets from virtually anywhere in the world. They are the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. I highly suggest you go try out TT, especially because you can try it for free. Just go to tryttnow.com and set up your account. So Tracy, I know that you don't follow gold and the dollar and the bond market nearly as much as Ira and I, but you do follow the WTI Brent spread. And I know there's been a lot of talk of that lately. What are you seeing in the WTI Brent spread right now? So the thing is that the spread um, widened significantly um, to, you know, almost $7, which was 
the U.S. being now an exporter, you know, that was kind of an unexpected move. Um, now what we're seeing, you know, I started pointing out, I think, you know, the spread is still one to watch, and I, I think it's still uh, a good trade. You know, as that spread was finding, what we, have, what we started seeing was China started importing more and more from the U.S. because, you know, they can pay less for it, obviously. So at this point, you know, I, and I think it's also something to watch as far as the price of both France and uh, WTI are concerned is Saudi Arabia's OPEC in general desperately needs the spread to come in or else they risk losing more market share to China, to the U.S. So I think it definitely should be on everybody's radar. How do you approach trading that spread? I'm not someone who trades spreads, so I'm always wondering how spread traders trade. Are you looking at charts? Is it fundamentals? Is it a combo of both? Both. It's absolutely both. I mean, you, you know, I knew that the spread was getting too wide um, and, you know, something, it was going to eventually, something, OPEC would need it to do something to bring that spread in. So, and then, and, and then the rest is just a technical, like I would trade anything, you know, I have my levels just like I would trade anything else. And what's the ratio you're trading that spread? So, so I'm just trading the one-to-one. I mean, there's a whole bunch of ways that you can trade it, and there's a whole bunch of ways you can trade the, the crack spread. You can do, you know, RBOB. You can include RBOB. You can include heating oil. Personally, I just do the one-to-one uh, Brent WTI. Cool. I know. And in the past, you and I have talked a lot about how you use technical analysis, so we're not going to get into too much into that. But when looking at a spread, I want to stay there a little bit. Give us one technical tool that you'll use when determining levels of support and resistance in that spread? Um, I mean, the same, it's basically the same things that I would use, you know, normally, um, but I probably trade the spreads on more of a larger time frame. So I'll trade the spreads based on like a four hour or a daily chart rather than if they think you need to back out from that uh, to trade the spreads, just because they move a little bit differently than the single product. Gotcha. Good to know. Now, we covered a lot of the topics I wanted to go over for today's show, but I did a tweet. A lot of people follow the show. You guys are some of my most popular guests on Futures Radio Show. We had emails written in, private messages sent to me. So although I couldn't get to everyone's questions on Twitter, these are the ones that I felt were the most relevant to today's conversation. So I picked a little over a handful of them uh, that I'm going to go through and ask both Tracy and Ira now, guys, I ask you if you just could spend just about a minute to a minute and a half max on these questions because I want to be able to get to as many as I can. Now, the first question to me, this one was more towards Ira. It's from 2P, uh, Pip Drunk on Twitter. Uh, he asked, uh, what are your thoughts on the EU and U.S. protectionism? Uh, it's, it's a very good question. I, this EU-U.S. protection, this is, this is a phony discussion. It's really picking up off of what happened last Wednesday in Davos with Secretary Treasury Mnuchin and this, uh, Commerce Secretary uh, Wilbur Ross, who discussed, you know, basically a trade war. In fact, you know, uh, Ross's comments were even worse because he said, we're going to the ramparts and we're sending our soldiers. So, OK, that's a trade war, which then irritated uh, the next day was an ECB meeting and Mario Draghi called the U.S. out for targeting their currency. Not happening. It's a bunch of baloney. The EU is all about protectionism. There is nobody, nobody of the major economies more protectionist than the French. It's been for so many years. So this has gone back and forth, back and forth. You know what? They're too t- tightly tied. They'll always have their certain barriers. It's a, it's a non-issue as far as I'm concerned. All right. Now, since that question was directed just towards Ira, I'm going to move on and talk to uh, you guys about a question that applies to both of you. And we're going to start with Tracy this time. This one's from Bob Brewer. He wants to know what style you use for risk management. For day trades, um, I usually trade with a 9 to 12 tick stop max. I mean, you shouldn't lean over that, in my opinion. And you shouldn't add into an already bad trade. So if I'm wrong on the trade, you know, if it goes 10 ticks against me, say, you know, I'm in my head, I'm Wrong on timing or wrong on the trade. So I'd rather get out of it quickly and find another level. I trade multiple contracts. So as the trade goes in my favor, then I start scaling out um, and tra- with a trailing stop. 
Now, what about on your swing positions? How are you determining your risk there? For my swing positions, I'll have a little bit of a wider stop, and um, sometimes I will scale into a position. So, you know, if I'm trying to get a bigger edge, I, I would have, say, two entries or three entries, and then I would have a stop, a stop above that. Not always, but, you know, I have scaled into, you know, if I'm trying to build a position, I, I have scaled into a position that way. But again, still with swing trades, trading with definite stops. Now, Ira, you mentioned that you do do some day trades and you do some medium to even longer term trades. Talk to us about how you manage risk. You know, Anthony, what your listeners have to always take away is risk management is risk management. You know, because the the whole idea when you're a trader and you've done your work, now you got to make sure that you stay, that you, you don't take a day where you're going to blow yourself up and you can't come back tomorrow because all your work, I, I spend a lot of time doing a lot of analysis and I'll get a big picture view. It may not profit wise. It may not show for a day, two days, three days. I have to make sure that I have enough capital to basically be able to come back tomorrow because tomorrow may be the day. So you want to always trade. You want to enter at your lowest risk tolerance possible. Now that may mean you may not, you may miss the initial part of a trade, but so be right. it. But, Nine times out of 10, it keeps me alive. And staying alive is what any time, it doesn't matter. When you have your capital at risk, you need to stay alive. And, you know, one of the first, the first thing I, I learned, the people who taught me on the floor was you've got to, pre capital preservation is the key. And then don't worry, you'll catch the good trades. You do your work, you work hard, you will find the good trades. You must preserve your capital. That doesn't mean you trade scared. That's not what I'm saying. You trade with, with, with an operable stop that protects your, your capital from disappearing. That, that's really the end of it. No, you're so right, I run. I remember back to my first days becoming a trader on the floor. I remember several traders saying to me, just be able to come back tomorrow. And I'd look at them and be like, well, what the hell does that mean? And, but over time, you, you learn that pretty quick. <laughs> um, so next question. Uh, this one's focused a little bit more towards Tracy. Now, Tracy, it's talking about Daniel Greenemeyer. He asked about USO options. This is Futures Radio Show, so we're not going to get into that. But he did mention backwardation and how to adapt. Now, I know that you trade uh, the one-year, six- and nine-month spread. Talk to us about how you do that. As far as backwardation is concerned, you know, or, or contango, it doesn't really affect uh, the way that how I trade and how I trade the spreads. Either I'm either buying the spread or or selling the spread. So, um, and, and, and it's, it doesn't change the way that I would trade. Let's put it that way. Gotcha. Now this one's from Patrick Henry and this one's more towards Ira. He wants to know your thoughts on silver Ira. Well, for Patrick Henry, that's, that answer is easy. I have one, one life to give for my country. Uh, no, um, <laughs> I, I, I love trading the silver cause it's, there's never a really good bull metal market in which silver doesn't lead. Only because, you know, the, it's a much more volatile factor. Look at the, the options pricing that will, will tell you how much more volatile silver is. And it's one of the perplexing things right now that even as gold has rallied, it's a steady rally as she goes. But the silver-gold ratio is, I, I keep it up all day long, so I'm in front of my screen. It's 78-17 using the Feb March uh, futures, which is historically high, especially with copper being where it is because usually copper and silver will trade closer together because they both have more industrial uses. But, but I'm, I'm seeing the silver market now and I get asked this question a lot uh, because people want to be, they're looking for professional traders are looking for a, uh, a bullish uh, metals market because that's what we're seeing. But as we we're sitting here right now, Anthony, uh, the silver, my silver is sitting on the 200 week moving average, but the formation is really starting to uh, broaden out. So we're going to come out of here one way or another. And if you're bullish gold, you think, well, silver is going to be uh, in play here. So I, I think it was a low risk player. I'm right now I'm playing it long silver, short gold. I ratio it up. You know, it, when you do it, you should really do it dollar for dollar. Uh, but I'm a little more bullish right now. So I'm leaning towards having more silver, but it's another play too. 
where I'm only looking to buy it on the break. So yesterday it had a substantial break, and today it's kind of just, you know, hanging in there. So I'm looking. But I, I think that silver looks very positioned to go. And tonight uh, for Trump's State of the Union, I'm going to, I'm going to be watching this. I'm, I'm not going to have a position on it. So I'm going to get flat by the end of the day because I want to see what, you know, Gary Cohn this morning on CNBC talked about a $1.5 trillion infrastructure program. Well, a massive infrastructure program like that ought, and I stress ought to favor silver because that's going to be the build out. There'll be huge demand, and especially if there's solar thing. You know, there's, silver went from being a, used, heavily used in photography to a lot of other uses in the um, computer age. So I'm looking at this one, but I, I'm very cautious with it because I'm, the fact that silver hasn't outperformed here keeps me trading is very small and very cautious. I, I need to see more. I would love to see the gold silver drop below the 200 day moving average, which it's been a, that's been a pretty good indicator, you know, both ways. And I'm violating myself by getting a little bit of my head ahead of myself here, but you know, I, I, I just like the formation that's building in silver outright. So uh, it's a good question. I don't know what else he wants me to tell you about it, but that's why silver will usually lead the way when when you really get a a, uh, a general bull market in the metals. Thanks, Ira. Now we have two questions that are very similar. One from Richard, where he mentions that uh, perhaps thoughts on CL pricing in relation to providing a possible trade in the Canadian dollar. And Tom Moore is asking, looking at the price of oil, are there any plays in currency markets? So I look at that and say to both of you, we'll start with Tracy. Are there any plays in any currency markets that you're seeing right now based off of the price of oil? We've talked about this at the beginning. So I'm watching uh, Euro as far as, you know, trades are concerned. For me personally, uh, I mean, CAD is correlated to WTI, but right now it's, you know, very sensitive, hypersensitive, I would say, to BOC. So for me right now, I'm, I'm not really trading – CAD as, as an oil currency trade right now. I'm playing the euro. Ira, are you looking at anything in any currencies based off of the price of oil right now? Well, uh, I'll pick up with Tracy because it, for, I trade a lot of Canadian dollars and there is times very tight correlation. Right now, Tracy's uh, right with Canadian because the Canadian Central Bank, uh, Pelos has been you know, kind of soft peddling the Canadian dollar uh, as far as interest rates, the United States has an interest rate factor, but the Canadian economy is very strong. The unemployment numbers have been outstandingly good. But it's, uh, and the Canadians actually rallied, uh, you know, somewhat over the last six months. And some of it's due to oil, but it's not, the correlation is not as strong as I've seen it in the past, which I, which I find interesting. But Canadian oil trades at a discount on the, on the global market anyway, because it's a heavier, especially the stuff up in Alberta out of the tire stands, it's a heavier uh, type of crew and does trade at a discount. But the Canadian is interesting to watch it, but it's not right now. It's not a, a strong correlation because of the interest rate factors. And people are nervous about NAFTA, you know, that mm -hmm. Trump is going to walk away from NAFTA. But walking away from NAFTA for Canada would in the short term be, would, would probably send the currency down substantially. So you're start, you're, there is a negative built into it. If NAFTA gets resolved without much change, I think the Canadian will will test that 120 to the dollar, and we'll probably go through there. And we'll probably, you know, if energy prices stay the same, and we'll probably go down to about 115. Especially if the global growth story holds, because don't forget, Canada is a lot more than just oil. Canada is is rich, like Russia is in. Uh, all types of natural resources. So I think once we have to get uh, resolved and it's not a radical resolution, uh, the Canadian should really be on some sound footing. Last question for today, guys. You know we can't go through a show these days without asking about cryptocurrencies. So we had several people <laughs> that wanted to know. We'll start with Tracy. What do you think of cryptocurrencies? I think that the, the technology behind cryptocurrencies is uh, very valuable. You know, you're seeing more and more banks, um, and I, I'm noticing uh, 
even the oil and gas industry is kind of trying to make a foray into the Ethereum blockchain, using the Ethereum blockchain for some of their technology. So I find it's interesting technology, but, you know, I, um, I don't trade it. Ira, the last time I asked you about <laughs> cryptocurrencies <laughs> was at the live event in October, and you said you get your jollies elsewhere. What are your thoughts on cryptocurrencies <laughs> now? Still the same? Well, you know, I, I also said, and, I, and Tracy's 100% right, I agree with her totally, that it, this is the blockchain technology. Blockchain fascinates me. There's so much to this, right? From oil and being able to trace your, um, your uh, oil purchases uh, perfectly because it'll be, and then smart contracts that come with it. And so it applies to the food. So blockchain has a lot to begin to understand and, and that's the technology. And blockchain really could drive Wall Street out. They don't, they're, they're not willing to admit to it because, you know, so much of money on Wall Street is made by, through stock lending. They lend your stock. You know, Anthony, you own a portfolio of stocks. It's held at the Depository Express Corporation. We don't hold the certificates in our boxes anymore. But if I, once blockchain technology really t takes over and the ledger, and I can let me hold my own stocks in my own ledger, thank you very much, and therefore you can't lend it out anymore. So it's going to have some impact, but I agree with Tracy wholeheartedly. And my, my tongue-in-cheek response now is I don't need the cryptocurrency. I have the Swiss franc. That's been the cryptocurrency forever. And now that they can print it willy-nilly and it doesn't even go down and they print all they want and more people go there to hide their money for whatever nefarious thing, that's the ultimate cryptocurrency. So I don't you know, I'd go play with it as you want. But it's interesting that you're asking the question because as we're sitting here, the Bitcoin is, is trying to break through uh, $10,000. It's hovering right at it right now. <laughs> yep, it is interesting. Uh, uh, it, just, it just did it. Anthony, what did you do? You, you sold the 10 lot there? <laughs> <laughs> One hand trading while I'm recording. Uh, would be, right. Uh, yep. Pilot. You guys, this was great. Thank you so much for coming on. We'll go back to Tracy real quick. Tracy, where can people follow you right. on Twitter, and what's a website they can catch you on? So um, I'm on Twitter at ShyGirl, and my website is uh, ShyGirl.com. Ira, Twitter, and the uh, website to your blog, please. Uh, notes from Underground, and you can uh, get it's still free. Uh, not sure how long it's going to be free, but it's free. It's free for, for now. And if you go to uh, Y-R-A-H-A-R-R-I-S dot com, it, uh, when you click on that, Notes from Underground will come up and you can register. And you know what? Scroll back through the archives because you'll find some interesting things, things that we talked about, Anthony, you know. And, uh, and the, I, the responses. I, you know what? The people who write into the blog now on a daily basis, it's so sophisticated. It's, it's really, it generates such great discussion because we've kept the wackos out and it's really discussions meant for marketing. And uh, that's worth it for itself. It, it's just to read the people who are writing in. I mean, I can, I, I'm, I'm absolutely floored some days by the high level of commentary that makes it onto that blog. No doubt. You know that I read your blog religiously. It's like an education every time I go there. Ira, thank you so much. Tracy, you as well. Love your posts on Twitter. Definitely my favorite follow when it comes to the energy markets. I appreciate all you do for traders, and I love your blog posts as well. Guys, this was awesome. Thank you again for coming on Futures Radio Show. Thank you. Hey, Anthony, thanks for having me. Tracy, it's a pleasure. Definitely a pleasure, Ira. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you have any questions or comments for myself or my guests, please visit futuresradioshow.com and sign up to be a premium member for free. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes.